everyone, and welcome to the ASSIST Community Conversation. And today we're going to be talking to three experiencers and listen to them share uh, different aspects of their experience and how it affected their life and what the beauty, uh, what beauty has been created actually because of their experiences. Before we get started, I want you to know what ASSIST stands for. It stands for the American Center for the Integration a spiritually transformative experiences. We are a nonprofit organization in the United States that educates mental health professionals on the difference between psychosis and spiritual emergence and emergency type experiences. And we also support experiencers uh, through an online forum of which we have approximately 800 members. We also train uh, experiencers to run their own support groups. So we train facilitators uh, for support groups. If you're interested in that, you can email me at info at ACISTE.org. And my name is Elizabeth Sabet. I'm the president of ASSIST. And I'm going to introduce our executive director here. Her name is Katrina Michelle. Uh, she is a holistic psychotherapist in New York City, and she also is our executive director and our co-host today. Hi, Katrina. Hey, Elizabeth, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we started these community conversations back in the spring as a way to bring more people into the ASSIST community. ASSIST has been around now for a while and we have annual conferences where professionals come to learn about spiritual emergency and uh, explore ways to work with experiencers who co they come across in their practice. And we recently started working more with peers and developing peer training. And now we're really trying to broaden into the, the virtual community that we can reach here through these conversations. So today I'm, I'm really excited about our topic. Uh, we have three experiencers with us who've all gone through their own personal journey. And uh, we'll let them talk about that in a little while. But um, what I think is beautiful about the people joining us today is that they've all really successfully integrated their experiences in their own unique ways and they've uh, moved forward into a place of serving others who are going through similar experiences again with their with their gifts that i think were were part of their spiritual journey so i would like to introduce you to them now um john stringer we'd like to start with you thanks for being with us john thank you grateful to be here so uh if you'd like me to tell a little bit about myself i'd love to Great. Um, i consider myself playing the role of life teacher healer uh billboard charting singer author and um, I do a lot of workshops, concerts, and retreats, um, largely due to the experiences I had expanding my awareness and um, tapping into different abilities that aren't considered the norm, let's just say. <laughs> and so I've been very uh, grateful for that. Great. Thanks, John. Uh -huh. um, good to have you with us. Thank you. And and then we also have Jasmine Russell. And Jasmine, tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Sure. So um, I'm Jasmine. I'm a holistic counselor. I'm a certified peer specialist. And I'm the co-founder of the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. Uh, we're a mental health uh, training organization trying to broadcast alternatives to people in the mental health field and work with um, clinicians as well as activists and people with lived experience, giving an alternative definition of mental health. Um, I'm here because I'm a spiritual experiencer, so to speak, in, in many different ways. I'm also a trauma survivor. Um, the things that I've experienced in my life have deeply impacted my work, and I'm so happy to be here. Excellent, Jasmine. Thanks. It's really good to have you with us. Uh, and we also have Sean Blackwell joining us today. Sean, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, yeah, my name is Sean Blackwell, and I had a spiritual emergency in 1996, which uh, really sort of opened me up and transformed my life a lot. Um, but then I sort of went back to my career in advertising and didn't do a whole lot with it uh, for the next decade. I moved to Brazil and became an English teacher. Um, but then uh, in 2007, we had I had some nieces. Um, and my wife's side of the family were having experiences and they were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. 
And I, I got very curious about the relationship between what I had experienced, the spiritual emergency, which was so beneficial, and bipolar disorder, where people are being medicated for life. Um, and uh, with that, I created a YouTube channel at the time, Bipolar or Waking Up, with the question, am I bipolar waking up? And started making video after video and actually started working with people, even in psychosis, work, helping people work through psychosis. Um, and then uh, wrote a book in 2011 about my story, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up? And, uh, but most recently, since 2013, I've had a healing retreat for people with bipolar disorder where I basically treat whatever disorder they have as a spiritual emergency after some careful screening and things like that. And I've been working on that for the last five years. And that's, that's more my focus now is this uh, healing retreat. That's great, Sean. Um, yeah, thanks for being with us. Great work that you are all doing. So I'd like to dive in with our questions. And our first question is, is really looking at your own experiences, uh, whether you consider it, you know, however you want to label it, your, your spiritually transformative experience. And tell us a little bit about that experience and how you interface with the mental health system or maybe religious systems as you were going through that and really how that affected your process and your integration specifically. So uh, whoever would like to start, please jump in. I guess I'll start. So um, I, in college, I think I had my, what I'd call my, we'll use the term spirit, first spiritual emergency. <laughs> um, but I had a very interesting uh, first year, went to uh, United States Military Academy. And during that time, I had a lot of emotional things I had to, um, started to emerge um, from childhood and, and so on. And I went to my first counselor there and had one session and I just didn't want to talk about the emotions that were coming up. I kept stuffing them down. And so... Um, we didn't get too personal. A lot of the emotions were from things from childhood involving my father who uh, ended, eventually left the country, but left when I was about uh, three or four years old. And so I hadn't seen him since. And all that emotion, I just didn't want to deal with, didn't know how to deal with it. Definitely didn't want to talk about it to a professional <laughs> when he asked me questions and um, was really torn. Uh, fast forward to my second year, I transferred to Morehouse College in Atlanta and um, I ended up uh, having an experience where um, I ended up coming out of my body, felt all the pain first and all the shame and guilt I had in my body, went through that, and then uh, approached this um, light that I, I recognized as Jesus, basically, because I was calling out for Jesus, grew up very Christian. And the next thing I can re recall is being enveloped in this light above my body watching my body feel shame and guilt and rocking back and forth crying, but being in this incredible love that was just overwhelming, I'll say, but the best way I could describe it is this unconditional love and light. And uh, it took a long time after to actually recognize in words, like I'm saying now, that I was literally uh, looking at my body, but I was in that light and love. It was a beautiful experience, wrote, wrote music about it. Um, my next encounter with uh, mental health actually was uh, probably two to three weeks later after that during my sophomore year I had a complete mental breakdown when a friend asked me a simple question how do you know we were talking about the bible and religion I was talking about I was gonna change my life and he asked me how do you know yeah but how do you know after my road answers of because I prayed this prayer and I felt it he kept asking me yeah but how do you know and it clicked and I realized in that moment, I didn't know. And I describe it as someone pulling the rug from under my feet. And suddenly, paranoia, panic, everything happened. I, I felt like I could hear stuff. I, could, I was aware of like all these thoughts and it was just the craziest thing. So I ran to the, the lobby uh, break room and I just sat down and rocked back and forth, started praying. I'm like, I didn't know what to do. And in all that, what felt like chaos, I could, uh, it was almost as if I could feel this voice come, come up. I couldn't quote hear it, but I could, I could listen to it. And it was telling me to go to the infirmary or the uh, nurse's station at the campus. So I went there, 
they end up sign let me call my mom i'm crying i'm paranoid i'm break i don't know what's going on and uh long story short they had me uh sign myself into a mental ward at a hospital here in atlanta for about seven days stayed there for a week recovered was told i had a complete mental breakdown which uh rightfully so <laughs> that's what it was that was in 93 i guess and uh ever since then my journey um has been to seek uh, and find out um, what would work for me. And I've taken many paths through religion, uh, went to other medical professionals or mental health professionals a couple of times to get brain scans, found out I, I was, my brain was equally polarized essentially, but I didn't have all the symptoms of bipolar, which I felt like was a plus. Great, I get the benefits, but not, <laughs> not some of the drawbacks. Um, but over a course of time, I uh, was led to meditation, and that was probably one of the biggest um, factors in learning how to um, navigate not only thoughts, consciousness, but emotions, and um, then really begin to tap into that knowing I'd heard when I was having my chaotic emergency, let's just call it. Um, and now I've been, I'm able to listen to that knowing consistently and teach other people how to do it. Um, through different things I have actually tapped into and um, brought out through meditation. So also my music has been impacted that way. So that's probably the quickest version I can give. Had a lot of expansive experience since then that I wouldn't call emergencies now. They're, they've been more transformative and um, been able to uh, experience a lot of uh, things, as I mentioned in the intro, outside of the norm, I would say, um, that I help other people do as well so i'll keep it short yeah yeah thanks john it's really beautiful and um you know i have so, so much reverence for all of these experiences and i know that they can be challenging to find words for and it's really brave to talk about it publicly like this um so thanks for sharing in that way a pleasure i love to talk about it <laughs> so thank yeah. you for letting me yeah and you know, so just to follow up with what you're sharing, you did you did end up dealing with the psychiatric system, and I'm wondering, looking back now, you know, that was some time ago, and you've integrated and had experiences since then, which it sounds like have been not traumatic, but more enlightening, more opening. Right. But I'm curious how you feel that that interface with the psychiatric system impacted your process, or whether it did at all. So um, in the um, experience that I had that mental breakdown the first experience and then getting the brain tested and scanned and all of that we were trying to find out what was quote wrong <laughs> and diagnose it label it etc and uh, what I was essentially led to I tried to find ways to deal with it through medication so I I can't even remember the early medications, but eventually I started using St. John's wort and some natural things to help with emotions. Because the biggest issue I was still having at the time were just ridiculous mood swings, like things I, I didn't understand and wake up angry and just kind of have a hair trigger emotional state. <laughs> couldn't under, couldn't, didn't know how to navigate, didn't know how to deal with it at the time. And so that was uh, what I was seeking that help for. Um, later when I was getting the brain scans, et cetera. And uh, the, I'd say the experience didn't really point me in a direction of equipping me with tools other than, I will say, being able to openly discuss, but I think I uh, discuss what's going on and dealing with traumas and things like that. But I, I was looking for something else um, where I could, was more empowering, I'd say, where I could gra grasp what was going on and eventually that led me to um, seeking meditation and things kind of outside of um, that avenue. So that was my experience. I, I, I wasn't uh, aware at the time that uh, how much this, those exp early experiences were part of my spiritual path as far as being able to break away from kind of this conditioned, limited way of viewing the world and I don't know if you just lost me, but my video stopped. We still hear you, so it's okay. Okay, oh, there we back. go. This conditioned way of um, viewing the world, my past, my beliefs, 
and being so stuck in them uh, that those initial ex emergencies helped me break from it. It helped yeah. me really recognize and let go of it kind of um, in a, a quote crises, but a very beneficial crisis. So that set me on a new path. Um, so I don't know if that directly answered your question, but uh, th that was, I've had limited experience in help within the um, uh, psychotherapy community or what have you, um, right. but I did find what I needed. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And it, it sounds like you, you, you just had a touch of contact with the mental health system and then right. the rest of your own journey. So that's correct. One way or the other, it was just part of the process. It didn't have a, a huge impact, maybe. So thanks, right. John. Thank um, you. All right. Jasmine? Hi. So thank you, John, for sharing your story. Um, so I I also had a had a brief encounter with the mental health system. Um, but interestingly enough, I kind of experienced my big mental breakdown while I was working in the mental health system as a crisis counselor. So that was kind of a, an interesting double-edged sword. Um, my first encounter with psychiatry was when I was 17. Um, I'm a trauma survivor. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse and incest from childhood. And um, at 17, I began having flashback memories and remembering that trauma. And in that same year, my best friend had committed suicide. And so it was this really, really intense time in my life. And, you know, what I had in my brain was, you know, all right, well, this is what people do. They go see a psychiatrist when all of a sudden their lives start to, you know, kind of crumble and turn to chaos. And so I um, spoke to a psychiatrist for about 15 minutes after 15 minutes, um, they gave me three preliminary diagnoses of bipolar mania, schizophrenia, and depression, and of course a prescription for an antipsychotic. And I think luckily at the time, I, I had enough of um, kind of a, a worldview and a different framework for understanding what was happening to me. I, I really felt it was such a result of the trauma I had experienced and that what I was experiencing was a normal reaction to trauma that I walked out of that office and said, I don't want to have anything to do with this at all. This is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, that kind of started my journey of trying to understand what is it that we consider mental health and mental illness. And I started studying psychology, uh, went to school for psychology, and then started working in the mental health system, trying to do my best to kind of, you know, make some, some changes from the inside. At least that was my hope. And very quickly realized that um, there were so many things that I felt were, were very um, ethically and morally not okay with me. There, you know, there were so many things that I felt really complicit in a very broken system. And just seeing the amount of trauma in the lives of people that wind up in the mental health system, recognizing that there's so many factors that go into that. So I think that was a big part, honestly, of, of what led me to have this, this big mental breakdown eventually. And at the same time, you know, it was at a time of year when I typically had flashbacks. I had an undiagnosed autoimmune disease. Um, I also was working about, you know, 24 seven on the clock. I was extremely stressed out. My body was in a in a really um, intense place. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm, I wind up fully clothed in a bathtub. My friends come home and find me there yelling, screaming, incantations, uh, seeing these, these beings, these dark beings in front of me who I consider to be demons and trying to say spells to get them to go away and uh, just kind of completely lost in this altered state. And luckily, the people who found me, I, I actually thought that that they were um, psychiatrists taking me to a mental to a mental institution, but they weren't. They were my friends, and then that's kind of um, one of the things that kind of set me on this path where I, I realized because I had worked in the mental health system that I didn't wind up. I didn't want to wind up in a place like that um, because I know what happens there. So. So um, I kind of brought my community closer and for about three months, I had really intense experiences, seeing visions, hearing voices, um, really kind of intense, terrifying things that were happening. And at the same time, I, I always kind of had this sense that there was some meaning behind it. There was some reason why this was happening. 
And so I'd, I'd have both, you know, incredibly elated experiences, feelings where, you know, I just felt so energetically expansive and at the same time, um, you know, felt, felt almost like thin skinned. Um, there were times when I had visions of what I consider possibly past lives. There were times um, when it really felt like a purging of old trauma, like a huge um, elimination of all of these beliefs, all of these mindsets, all of these feelings, all this shame and guilt and um, everything that was kind of flowing through me and out of me. And so it, it kind of, there was, there was part of me that, you know, was like, well, maybe they're right about you. Maybe you do have this mental illness. And then there was a, a much stronger part of me that was, you know, really kind of felt that there was a, an incredible meaning behind what was happening. So with, with the help and the support of my community that came around me, I was able to come through that place um, and really develop a completely different life from where I started from. So in some ways, I believe, you know, as sometimes I call it psychosis, sometimes I call it a deep spiritual transformation. There are so many ways that that I've kind of made meaning out of it over the years, but over the last three years, it, it really has been the most important, significant, and most amazing things that's ever happened in my life. Yeah, wow. Thanks for sharing that, Jasmine. You certainly went through a lot, and to be able to say, you know, that this was an awesome experience at the end of it is, is quite something. Thank you. Sean, we'd love to hear your story. Okay. Well, as, <clears throat> as you guys were talking, John and Jasmine, um, I've, I've had four stories that I could probably talk about and they're all entirely different. I mean, completely different things, but only one got me hospitalized. And so I'll, I'll focus on that one. Um, and that's really the one that sort of set me on my journey anyways. Um, I've been sort of going in and out of depression for about seven years in my 20s, trying to find meaning in life, trying to find meaning in work. And uh, it led me to a self-help course that I was taking. And the self-help course was very stimulating. And they took us into a meditation of just five minutes to focus on your fear. And when they did that, I didn't think I had any fear. But in the middle of it, I remembered a scuba diving accident that I had had like two months earlier where I almost died in the accident because I lost my weight belt 90 feet below sea level. And in that moment, I just felt this punch in my chest and then boom, and I just started bawling, you know, started crying very hard, feeling the fear that I had repressed in that moment. So it was, it was a trauma from just two months earlier. It wasn't childhood trauma, it was just two month old trauma. And, uh, when that was over, I realized that I felt fear just like every other human being, and that made me feel more connected. And all my senses sharpened. I could see detail in curtains I couldn't see before. I could hear things that, you know, details, not hallucinations, like real sensory enhancement to the whole thing. Um, and to make a long story short, um, had a lot of insights coming up, started talking to my family about things, problems in our past, and all this kind of thing and continued on this course until the last day of the course where I realized that everything felt like I was in a dream. And then I thought, that's what's going on. I died in the scuba diving accident and I've been dreaming since then. This is, this is all a dream. And um, then I was going to meet God. I was going into a, I, I figured I was in some sort of, a, what's that word again, between heaven and hell? Bardo? Uh, Bardo starts with a P. Purgatory. 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 Let's say Christian. Purgatory. I was in a sort of a purgatory and I had to get to God somehow. And, and I'm in a hotel and so I have to face my fears. So I, I pee on the rug in the hotel and then I lay down in it and I'm just waiting to be taken away by God. And but of course, you know, it's the police that come to take me away and they put me in the ambulance. But I still thought I was going to heaven. That was the funniest part is I'm in the ambulance going, this is the craziest way to get to heaven I ever could have imagined. I, taking an ambulance to heaven. I mean, this is really funny, right? And um, even at the, ho at the hospital, I thought it was a spaceship taking me to other parts of the universe. Um, but then also in the hospital, I started to go into a kind of regression into my infancy, which was actually quite positive. 
took me into connections with the universe and, and the beginning of, of life itself and connections with the animals like apes and things like that. I was making ape noises in the, in the hospital. Um, so it was pretty wild. Uh, of course, you know, I wasn't getting any sense of connection or support from psychiatry. You know, I was handcuffed to the bed. They forcibly injected me with, you know, five guys with their hands on me. Um, and that was really rough. Uh, but my family was there and they were quite supportive of me. And, and one thing about me was I was one of those guys in high school that was like popular and top of the class and all that kind of stuff. And so when I ended up in the hospital, everybody was completely shocked. I was like the last person anyone ever would have imagined ending up in a psychiatric hospital. It was like that. Um, and, it, and it happened when I was 30. And, but because my experience was so spiritual, you know, this sensory sensation, feeling like I knew things I never knew before, thinking I was going to meet God, there wasn't anything paranoid or negative in it. So I knew I was in a spiritual experience. And some preparation I had had studying Buddhism, where they teach how life is an illusion, sort of got me ready. I could sort of understand I was in a kind of another dimension, you might say. And so I could go with it. It, it never really scared me. And I just thought that the psychiatrists were idiots and I need to get out of there as fast as possible. So I was really lucky. Um, my parents didn't really trust what was going on in the hospital either. And they would um, take me home during the day. And after four days, I was released. So I never really internalized that message of like, you can't trust your brain. You are mentally ill. You need meds for life. You know, those kind of messages never really went into my system. Um, yeah, and then it took a few months to be able to sort of get used to being around people again. And I returned to work five months later and my career frustrations eased a lot because my career got much better. Um, my salary went up 300% in three years. I mean, I went from like $35,000 to $100,000 a year in three years. It was just like, boom. Um, but still, I was looking for a spiritual calling and I was doing a lot of dream analysis at night. I was going to see a friend who was a past life therapist. Every lunch hour, I'm in the New Age bookstore because I could feel my advertising life was quite plastic and shallow and didn't work for me, but how was I gonna survive in the real world um, without making, making some money? And, um, but I got a lot more intuitive. And a year later, I had a dream. I was, had a dream to go to Peru. I felt like I was being called to Peru and I went on this shamanic trip to Peru. And that's where I met a woman who was born on the same day as me, March 27th. And she was from Brazil and she became my wife. And so now we've been living down here for almost 20 years. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and a life that became much more intuitive, much more creative. And, and really in the service of people who are stuck in the same position, because the difference between me and someone who's currently struggling with meds for life is, wow, thin, like thin, thin, thin. If I had been in that hospital for two more weeks, I might be medicated for life, you know? So I don't forget that, you know, I don't forget that. And, and I've been working at it for the last uh, 11 years, you know? Yeah, so I guess that's, that's my story, I guess, for now. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, thanks for sharing in, in so much detail. And uh, yeah, I really think it's important what you highlighted right there about recognizing that there's a very fine line between somebody who's on med management for life versus somebody who sees themselves as kind of having this extraordinary trip through different dimensions and is opened up and trans transformed for the better through it. So thanks. For yeah, there, there, there can be, there, can, there certainly can be. And then the other thing I've learned doing this work and talking to people online is that there are people that are definitely not in the position to work through this material and are probably better off being medicated for life. But, you know, I think that at least 50% of people could, be bene could benefit, you know, who are medicated for life, benefit from at least knowing the perspective that you guys are sharing here, that we're all sharing, you know. And everybody goes through an aspect of this that's deeply spiritual, and it's still not talked about, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, that's what we're talking about today. Yeah.
<laughs> so uh, I'd like to turn it back to Elizabeth uh, to ask a question. Thank you, Katrina, and thanks everyone for sharing. Um, each of your personal stories perfectly illustrate what we mean when we talk about spiritually transformative experiences, right? And specifically in that as a result of successfully integrating your experiences, you've built your life's work. All three of you have built your life's work around being in service to others, uh, other people's spiritual journeys. So please tell us a little bit about this transformation, um, who you are, what your values and worldview are now compared to prior to, um, and compared to who you were and uh, before your experience and what your worldviews were before. So, you know, what was the transformation and, and uh, before and after? I guess I'll start again. <laughs> so uh, for me, um, the transformative experience is continuous. Um, but I think I, from the early time, I went from a very um, narrow view, religious conditioned view, limited view of, you know, my spiritual path, let's just say, and um, worldview was more like everybody's going to hell if they don't believe like me. <laughs> and, uh, and the nuances and all of that I'd get into, but I was, I grew up very Christian um, from the South, uh, Tennessee, in fact, and uh, kind of went to a non-denominational Christian church. And so my, my view was very based on that. But at the same time, there was this um, part of me that knew in the background I was living a double life because I was still doing a lot of the things that I deemed as, quote, sin and shouldn't be doing and kind of hiding that and putting this other persona um, up. And then I'd break away from that and let go of religion completely and just do what I wanted to do. Then I try to come back and I find myself bouncing back and forth. Uh, hence the conversation I had with my sophomore college roommate when I was telling him, I'm going to commit, go back to doing what the Bible says, this, that, and the other. So that was kind of my view then. Um, thankfully, that break breakdown had me experience something I hadn't experienced before. Um, and then get in tune with this knowing that was guiding and directing me through the chaos uh, that I hadn't recalled ever experiencing. Um, and so uh, through that journey, I began to, um, as I mentioned, once I got to meditation and I, prayer was probably the biggest thing I would use, but it was a one way type of tool where I would just say what I needed and hope for answers. And I'd get answers, but it wouldn't be something I'd uh, like that knowing that came through. It'd be something that would happen and uh, what have you. So I'd use prayer through this journey of transforming. And that's what led me to meditation, led me to different answers. And suddenly my worldview began to expand. Um, honestly, um, through first encountering energy um, uh, in a very visceral way, where uh, in one meditation, I had what people call a Kundalini awakening or experience, but I had the energy come up my spine, my, my neck was locked back, I couldn't swallow and I was really freaking out um, uh, because of my older worldview. I thought maybe I was being demon possessed. <laughs> and so I uh, researched it, found out it was something called Kundalini energy or whatever, but the meditation led me to finally um, tapping into uh, the knowing in a, in a new way. Um, I don't want to make this long, but I would see things like 11, 11 and different things. I'd research that. Uh, my wife and I had all these, uh, when we started dating, had all these synch uh, synchronistic events happening. And due to that energy um, awakening or moving in me, I began to meditate and I would allow that energy to just do whatever it would. And it moved me all sorts of ways to the point where one night my mouth moved and words came out. Um, and of course I was freaked out again and, <laughs> found out that, you know, uh, people call it channeling. Um, but I was able to thankfully look back in my Christian upbringing and, and look back in the Bible um, to where uh, Jesus would teach about these words are not my own. They are from the Father 
or in the Aramaic, the I am, or, you know, the source. Um, they are coming in, there's the Rauk, Aruka, or however you say it, um, that spirit that teaches all things coming through. So I had references from my old life to connect to what was happening with me and uh, eventually begin allowing these teachings to come through and um, uh, using those teachings for my own life. And those teachings actually um, helped, took me through something very similar to the 12 Steps program, um, which was fascinating to me once I later found out what the 12 Steps were. So I was like, wow, 12 Steps are pretty spiritual. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but they uh, just went through all of that process, um, taking responsibility for a lot of my actions that uh, through my childhood and on that people didn't know about and was just guided through that knowing and listening to that knowing um, to change my life really transform my life and my views and so my views became more of to to sum it up viewing life very similarly to how Sean was explaining it as an illusion but that at the essence we are all extensions of this source and this source energy is what animates everything. And we are all this one connection uh, or this oneness that extends and creates all form, all action, all thought, all this and all that. And it actually fit what I grew up hearing or seeing is quoted as uh, the teacher Yeshua or Jesus taught that we're all one and this, you are not of this world. And all. so it was, it was pretty fascinating to expand my view didn't eliminate uh, some of the fundamental things I learned growing up, but it really expanded on it. And uh, I was able to let go of things that didn't work for me anymore um, and begin to also learn how to navigate the emotions and the beliefs I'd created that were really creating blocks and tension and resistance in my body, uh, in my emotions, uh, and in my life, and uh, begin through that, what I call alignment, um, uh, this meditation that allows me to align with that source, my awareness begin to expand and begin to access abilities such as um, kinesthetic abilities to um, uh, cognitive abilities to know things, but also to feel things I didn't feel before and, and navigate them in new ways and even bring through different frequencies that allowed shifts in harmony in my life. And so all of that I've used to um, assist myself <laughs> in navigating life, sharing with others, but also to create things such as music. Uh, my last two solo albums were all created um, that way. Some of my old rock band stuff was created that way too at the end of that, um, my band days. But all of the new material has been just brought through that way. So the frequencies, the um, language in it, and then also I've uh, been able to publish a book that's uh, of just pure teachings that really help my framework um, in looking at life period. So my worldview has expanded <laughs> to a, a, a very uh, multi-dimensional view compared to where I was, I guess you could say, but also an empowered view that helps me create internally first and then uh, navigate what unfolds from there. That's absolutely beautiful, John. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, it's interesting to hear how you were able to go back to your the, the faith of your childhood and the roots and find those truths in a more expanded way in the Bible. I think that's also very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Jasmine, would you like to share? Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting looking back on, on the person that I was before this, this experience because I, it's almost somebody that I, I don't really uh, recognize so much anymore. But I mean, essentially, my, my view, my story about myself and my life ended with trauma survivor. You know, for so much of my life, that's what kind of dictated my world. That was the identity that I kind of clung on to, um, that I believed I was going to have to navigate and struggle with my entire life. And 
Um, so there was that aspect of it. And then also there were so many ways that I just was kind of operating unconsciously throughout life. So just, you know, everything was about being in survival mode. I didn't know how to rest, how to take care of myself, how to listen to my body. I was always um, kind of, I grew up Catholic, but I was always kind of more interested in earth-based magic and spirituality and things that, that weren't uh, necessarily Judeo-Christian in culture. But um, and I had always kind of been around spiritual counselors. So I, I had had that worldview and, and I had been, um, you know, practicing intuitive development for a long time. But after the experience, the, the crisis, the awakening, so to speak, um, that became probably fundamental in my life beyond anything else, beyond what I was trying to struggle through and accomplish and achieve and um, survive. It, it really just became about listening to my intuition. And so um, post, post um, the breakdown, it, for me, integration was really much more about making the, kind of, the kinds of life changes that I needed to make in order to become the person that I knew I was supposed to be. And those life changes were, were pretty dramatic. You know, I was kind of single-mindedly before living this life, living in New York City around all this chaos and, and you know, just like I knew I was gonna work in the mental health system for this many years and then go on to do X, Y, and Z. I had this very clear-cut story. And next thing I knew, I was moving to Woodstock to be around trees, moving away from people in a place where I could experience life in a very different way. I became much more sensitive to everything, to the messages of my body, to the messages of the earth, to the messages of source, to, um, you know, I, I needed to kind of, I knew I needed to hone that and be in a place where that, that could be allowed. And so I moved, I changed my diet, I changed, um, pretty much everything about my lifestyle. I felt like a newborn, you know, like so raw and pink, like in this world where I, I just kind of felt like it definitely felt like a rebirth. And there were parts of me that really, um, we're still trying to kind of cling to that old person, that old identity who I thought I was. There were so many things that I, you know, couldn't do after, um, after the mental breakdown. I had a two and a half year writer's block. I couldn't write and writing was so important to me. There were certain things I couldn't read. I couldn't experience. And I had all this, this judgment about it, but I realized that once I kind of let go of, of that judgment, of that person that I used to be, of that identity, of all these things that I was clinging to, I actually had the opportunity to create a completely different life for myself, one that, that I actually never thought would be possible. Um, I, I, I think before I didn't think that it was possible to overcome trauma in this way, that I thought it was something that was always going to be part of my life, and realized that there is something so far beyond that there's a, a level of thriving that um that i just never knew existed and so yeah <laughs> my goodness that's beautiful and so representative of many experiencers whose life completely changes and as you said in order to integrate your integration was making changes to become who you knew you were supposed to be. Is that what I understood correctly? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and I know many experiencers personally that have had that same transitional experience where everything has to change. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. And Sean. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think I'll go with Jasmine and John's answers. I think they were pretty comprehensive and I think my experience in development has been like 80% of what you guys have been talking about already. So I, I don't think I'll repeat that. I, I will say, you know, in, in terms of contrast, <clears throat> uh, right now, you know, my main work is I'm a certified holotropic breathwork facilitator with Stan Groff's uh, Groff transpersonal training, which, you know, the intention there is to, uh, help facilitate people go into spontaneous or to um, non-ordinary or holotropic states in the service of healing trauma and things like that. that. That's what I'm working on. And I've taken for my retreat process, 
some modifications are needed. So I call it bipolar breath work instead of holotropic breath work. And I spend all week not only guiding people into, you know, these non-ordinary states for healing purposes, but also going in there with them. So I'm in non-ordinary states all the time. I mean, it's just a, a regular thing for me. And just with the breathing, you know, and, uh, and you know, I used to be in advertising. So I could, it's like night and day, you know, couldn't, couldn't be any more different. Feels so real, feels authentic, doesn't pay much. It's what life's supposed to be, you know. All right, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. I love that. And, and the, the payback that you're getting is, you know, multifold compared to what it was before. My yeah. wife and I call it spiritual currency. <laughs> <laughs> spiritual currency, that's right. Those have been the physical later, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. And somehow the bills kept keep getting paid, you know. Somehow that's it right. just keeps yeah. going. I don't know how it happens. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have a job uh, lined up for January. Like, there's nothing there. Yeah. Something will come along. That's Something right. always comes along. Okay. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I can um, I can empathize with that one. I know I drove people really crazy with that perspective um, when I was running a family business and uh, we owned a childcare center. And you know, maybe eight kids would drop out. You know, you'd have maybe a family of four or a family of five, and you they'd both drop out that month, and it'd be like, oh well, you know, it comes and it goes. You know, like a flock of birds, they come in and they go out. And it all works out and uh, no stress <laughs> and and you know being considered um, unprofessional because of that trust in the flow of nature and as uh, John put the the currency right and how the currency flows spiritually when you trust it's it's a totally different way of living so thank you I'm going to turn it back to Katrina now for our next question thanks yeah, I'm, I'm really resonating with what was just said. It's, uh, it's so important to remind ourselves that that is the spiritual journey, right? It's about trust and this process just shakes us out of our thinking that we have anything under control. And so, um, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's good to remember that we just kind of allow and flow and trust and stay in, stay in the process that we're, we're good, we're taken care of. So um, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so my next question, I think, I think you guys may have actually covered in your answers. Um, it was just talking about, you know, how we conceptualize this idea of spiritual emergence as a process that is developmental in the sense that it, it brings you to a more enhanced state of being, um, as opposed to what we narrowly frame as maybe some sort of, um, a mental illness, which has a regressive quality or is limited to the sense that, well, maybe we can only heal you back to the place where you are, but this is really something that takes you beyond, takes you to an enhanced state. Um, and it's, it's about growth. So the question was about what gifts do you feel like have come from your experiences? And I know, um, you know, John, like you mentioned, the channeling and the music and Jasmine and John, you've touched on that. Is there anything you wanted to add to that in terms of some of the gifts, um, you know, whether they're artistic or intuitive gifts that have come from your process? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Uh, the intuitive abilities have been uh, beautiful in that listening clearly to that knowing that I talked about allowed me to expand and give me a framework for, um, I guess, navigating consciousness in a sense of um, accessing what through that meditation I call um, aligning with source uh, through our inner being or what have you, but then also being able to expand out into um, other, uh, for lack of a better word, people call them guides, angels, um, et cetera. That was my first guidance was coming through them and they were teaching me how to align with source directly to bring that through. And then that was the next stage. Um, then I began to expand into um, being able to expand my awareness um, and assist others in not only getting answers, but in also finding out what's going on within their, let's call it their soul's blueprint or their 
um, energy, um, as well as things in their physical, the appearance of the physical things that are going on. So was fortunate to be led to Bali to um, a transformative workshop where in the mornings it would lead meditation, co-lead meditation. And this wonderful master intuitive teacher came to participate, gave us all readings, uh, nailed things like what was in front of my house back in the States. She lives in Canada, so there's no way she could have known. But like literally what was left, like the bicycle and the scooter and all this stuff. So it was very validating that, okay, this is the real deal. Then would talk about my daughter. She didn't know I had a daughter and, and the exact issue that she and I was dealing with and what I needed to um, do to transform that. I got back, used that um, information. It's totally transformed my relationship with my daughter, uh, my middle daughter, but also developed a relationship with that teacher. We formed a uh, online community where we teach people intuitive abilities, everything from aligning with source to expanding your awareness, releasing what we call blocks. Um, these blocks are often the things when we go through emotional traumas, there's some sort of energetic um, um, block cr often created, whether it's a belief about life or uh, resistance about what was experienced, some sort of judgment, but we usually call it a skewed perspective. So we teach how to uncover these skewed perspectives and allow that inner knowing to help release them. So those are other, other abilities um, um, that came through, but really tools uh, to help people <laughs> let go of the stuff that doesn't work anymore. That's causing these cycles of suffering and uh, just uh, think creating things that, uh, that people would call suffering, which I don't judge as bad anymore. I even see the suffering as all beneficial. It's just a different level of good that um, essentially will help people increase their desire to know who they really are and find their power. So I think it all works. Now I see it as something all working perfectly together from traumas to the worst things I can think of that I would normally used to call evil. Um, I've now been able to access levels of consciousness that have helped me um, integrate, I like that word, integration, um, with all the frequencies we create and the levels of meaning that we create um, and allow me to choose things that work better and then helping other people do the same. So that's um, probably in a nutshell some of the other things that um, I was able to access through this journey. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for expanding on that. Yeah. It's really, really things that many of us don't ever understand until you directly experience it. So, uh, I, and I'm so sorry. One last thing I meant to mention that Sean reminded me of. He mentioned the shamanistic journey. I love shaman, uh, shamanistic journeys and ceremonies and got to participate in some wonderful um, um sacred ceremonies due to the guidance I was receiving. Um, and so that's been a, a, another level of the journey for me. Things I would have shunned and never done when I was young and, and very limited in my view of what was acceptable or right and wrong. It, that knowing led me to those things to expand and experience just amazing connections and oneness and um, kind of amplifying that understanding of uh, what we are, and ex but experiencing it, uh, making it real in the experience, or realizing it in the in our actual experience. So, um, so yeah, I, I failed to mention that, and I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's wonderful, and I I think that's so important to mention that you know being led to find the communities and the teachers that can help us on these paths that you know, our culture doesn't necessarily have these resources out there for all of us to see, but, you know, when we tune into what we really need, we can start to do the research and right. find what we need. So thanks for right. that up. Um, Sean or Jasmine, anything else you wanted to add to these this questions about gifts of the experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I, I could categorize the greatest uh, gift that I've received in, in really just one phrase, which is a, a deep listening. I think what really characterizes this integration experience is just um, 
the ability to to see even even the terrifying experiences, even you know the the scary or so called dark experiences, as something that's so meaningful and useful as a message for us, for our bodies, for our well being. Um, I would say that after after the experience, I was kind of able to sit with some of these because uh, you know feelings come up life experiences happen and and we go through different things and it it's not as though you know difficult experiences stop happening but i think what really shifted for me was this ability to sit and stare at it in the face and where that that came from was you know as i had some really amazing people in my life guiding me through um the the spiritual crisis and sometimes one of the things that they said was really um um to there were times when i was so terrified of what i was experiencing that i would close up and lock up and tense up and i had some people guiding me through that saying what if you what if you do just talk to you know speak to these beings what if you ask them why they're there what if you look them in the eyes and through that i think that's really kind of carried on with me this ability to whenever difficulty or dark experiences happen i'm really able to keep this mindfulness about it and this um, ability to sit with it and and go really deep with it and figure out where it's coming from and transmute it in a different way. And then, you know, there's also like the, the more fun, magical aspects. I would say that I've always been kind of a floaty, airy person. And after this experience, it felt like almost a, a renewed commitment to being a human on this earth, on this planet, and reconnecting to the earth, reconnecting to my body in a lot of different ways. And so I started studying herbalism and herbal medicine and, um, you know, some of these other, other really old, ancient ideas that have been around for a long time that many of us have forgotten. And I started actively, you know, when you're in, an, in altered states, there, there's nothing that you can't, you know, listen to. And so I would start listening to the plants, listening to the flowers, listening to the earth in this kind of amazing way and hearing these messages. Um, at times I would kind of, you know, be introduced to a new plant that I would talk to and kind of ask, you know, what is this medicine? What, is, what medicine do you have to offer? And I would hear these responses and then I would go up online and, and kind of figure out what, uh, what people are talking about these plants are good for and it would always kind of match up and align. Or I'd have dreams about uh, medicine that I've never even heard of before, um, you know, vitamins, minerals, or plants that I, that I had never heard of and come out of these dreams and just know I have to go find that medicine that's medicine for me and would have the greatest healing that I've that I've ever had. So, so there are all these like really unique magical qualities, but I think how I would characterize almost all of it is as this deep listening, as taking the time to really, to sit with whatever's coming up, to sit with your dreams, to sit with your, you know, the plants and the animals and other beings around you and intuit things about other people and their experiences. I've had times where I've, you know, I've, there, I get a new client and I've never met them before. I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them. And I'd have a dream or a vision the night before that kind of described their entire life story to me and go into the session and find out that that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. So I think all of us have the capacity to have these types of experiences if we're listening. So yeah, beautifully I, expressed, Jasmine. Yeah, Sean, please. Uh, yeah, um, I think that in terms of the spiritual emergency thing happening, sort of going everywhere, transform, transformational experience, I think pretty much everybody who goes through that has a strong, you know, empath side, very emotionally resonant with what other people are, are experiencing. Uh, you're no longer treating other people like a transaction, which is the way our society is set up now it's like we're okay we're doing things for each other but what's the tone you know you're more aware of the relationship when you've gone through this kind of experience and one thing i'm learning uh through the work is that you know once people have done personal work for themselves then they start to take on a capacity to help other people heal uh like like john was talking about in the breath work i'm doing if i'm doing breath work with a client I'm with the intention of just working through my own stuff. I'm starting to work through their stuff as well. You know, it's not 
with an egoic intention. It's just doing what I would normally do, but their material comes my way because what we're accessing is a, is a healing field. You know, it's a, it's a higher dimensional intelligence and it's, it wants to work with us. It wants to collaborate through us. And, um, but it's a mistake to think of yourself as the healer. That's the tricky part is because you're not really the healer. If the minute you think you're the healer, the whole dynamic shuts down. You have to go with a humble intention and, and work from there. And I think there's huge potential down the road, especially for people who are labeled with bipolar disorder to start to do some deep personal work on themselves, even with the intention that they're going to be able to help other people down the road. Okay. That's it. Yeah, it's so funny. I, I wanted to piggyback on something Sean said. No, it's cool. that? Um, and, and I agree. I think um, um, often when people think of healers, they think that uh, the source of healing or the source of the energy or what have you is coming from that individuated point of awareness is what I like to call it, that person. Whereas if there's really oneness, what's doing the healing, <laughs> you know, there's really one, this, what we're creating is this experience of letting go. Um, that's all coming from one thing. Um, but so that's why it's funny when I listened, the knowing was telling me I'm a healer. That's my role. But the reality is what I am is the oneness. That's what does, that's what's creating it all. I'm like the vessel in this illusion role of form or what have you. That's the way I look at it now, allowing or channeling, the true self or the oneness or the field as you called it Sean or or what have you so so I, I do think there it's important to if you can recognize um, and be, begin to let go of the identity of who is actually doing the healing <laughs> like Sean was saying uh, but then also begin to shift that identity to you are the healer in the sense of you're not this separate thing you're all of it um so i think there's there i think there's many ways to navigate it is my point um depends on what perspective you're coming from but something you said just made me want to respond to that thought that was a, a good point and also something to add to it well people will say to me too though as the process unfolds with what i'm doing they'll say well shouldn't it be like this and we want to get at that and this should be done like and this is my issue. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't have any control about what's going on here. I don't Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, sorry. One, I can I'm, I'm so, so many things are uh, popping up for me. The other, another thing you said and remind me of practices, because you mentioned breath work mm -hmm. and um, Jasmine, you also mentioned um, different practices you've gone through. The, the interesting thing that I got early on as beginning to listen to this knowing was, it's important we find the practices that work for us. Um, whatever our journey is, um, part of the journey is looking for those practices and finding those practices, um, not just because of the practice, of course, what it leads to in our expansion and in our, uh, quote, unfolding or l releasing, um, but also um, I think part of finding the practice so that work for us is kind of like breaking the egg. Um, the chicken has to break the egg. You probably heard that analogy to build up the momentum to be able to operate in this new expanded environment. I feel as if part of our journey in all life experience, but even in finding those practices that work for us, help us build that uh, discipline, build our will, build so many things that assist us in um, what I look at as one, shifting our identity to one of oneness, but secondly, letting go of, of the things that are limiting us um, so we become more limitless, and then also accessing our power, taking it back so um, we can create from a new place of, of empowerment versus feeling victimized or subject to some um, <laughs> uncontrollable forces to an extent, at one level of consciousness, yes, we're not in control, but then as we level up, as I like to say, and expand into higher levels of consciousness, we start to find out that who, who we really are is not this limited thing we thought. 
And in fact, we can trust life because we're actually the essence of all of it. <laughs> so technically we are in control. Just depends on what point of awareness you're, you know, you're, you're aiming at. So it's just funny how as you begin to um, access these other levels, you see things so differently um, and it brings more trust, more empowerment. And, and, and you know that everything is happening for you, as Jasmine was saying earlier, and all is well, always is. So, so, yeah, so yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to piggyback off of that. It, the idea, I think we have this cultural idea that healing is something that happens to you, like you said, Sean. And, and I, I think so much of healing is not even necessarily, uh, you know, anyone providing knowledge, providing the, you know, the methodology or whatever it might be. It's really just being able to sit with another human being with what they're going through with total acceptance and non-judgment and providing that type of space so that people can learn how to look inside because we, we really have so much conditioning on how to look at ourselves with judgment, how to look at ourselves with pathology, with criticism. Um, and I think so much of what we consider healing is is showing people that, you know, if I can look at you with love and if I can see what you're going through as something that's meaningful and help you find whatever that means to you, however you want to understand what you're going through, um, that's where the healing happens. It, it happens, you know, within relationship and it happens within that person because each person has this incredible capacity to heal. It's not, you know, it's not a transaction, like you said. Beautiful. Well, there's there's so much wisdom on this panel. I'm just thrilled with it. Um, I'm kind so, of impressed. I'm sorry. What was that? I'm kind of impressed with you guys. By the way. <laughs> yes. Likewise. The oneness. The oneness is impressive. <laughs> um, so uh, I have one more question, and then we have a few questions uh, from people here attending. Um, and my question is simply. A curiosity based on you know what my the subject of my dissertation research was which was um how did, how did resistance to this whole process come into play in your in throughout the course of your spiritual emergence um if resistance was there by yourself by others and whether or not there there was something there for you some um understanding about the role of that if there's anyone that would like to speak to that I can definitely speak to that. I had a I had a lot of resistance, but also I think at the same time what created the conditions for that type of of, you know, spiritual breakdown was resistance in the first place. Was resistance to listening to, you know, opening up a, a new life path. And so in some ways I feel like our minds, our bodies, spirit, everything like there's nothing you can do to, <laughs> to run or to hide from it. If you're not listening, your body is going to give you those messages. It's going to tell you to slow down. And, and so I feel like also as I was going through, um, you know, the really intense aspects of the, of the emergence, um, meaning, you know, like really seeing beings right in front of me or, or hearing voices or these really kind of intense terrifying experiences like i said before my my instinct my inclination was to tense up and to like you know cover my eyes and say no 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 i don't want this to happen i can't see this i'm you know i i i don't want this they they can't get me and and like i said i already kind of had some some um interaction with uh, spiritual counselors who kind of taught me, you know, protection, energetic boundaries, things like that. And so I had this, this tense, um, you know, this, this hardening almost of the experience. And it wasn't until someone said to me, and I, I wouldn't necessarily tell this to people because I know that my reaction when, when this person said it to me was one of anger, where they actually said, you know, what would happen if you, if you just allowed it? what would happen if you just surrendered to the experience? And in my head, I was like, Surrend you must have no idea what's going on with me if you think that, that that's the best thing for me right now. You must not know how terrifying this is. But in truth, he was right. Because the second that I did, the second that I allowed and said, okay, you know, I had, I had beings, you know, sitting right beside me saying, well, you're going to die. You're going to die today. And that's such a hard thing to say, 
well, okay. But once I did, once I, you know, responded to those messages with, well, okay, show me what you want to show me. Tell me what you want to tell me. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm not, I'm not shutting the doors on you anymore. Um, that was the moment when everything changed. That was the moment when, you know, I was able to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel when they, they kind of, you know, left and, and I, was, I was left with this opening, this new path. So um, resistance was a huge part of the struggle and it can, be, it can be incredibly terrifying to let go and allow yourself to experience the things that society is saying you must be crazy for. Um, but sometimes that's the only thing to do and sometimes that's the only remedy. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Sean, John, any thoughts on resistance before we move on to the questions from the audience? I thought she said, well, um, she mentioned a couple of words, allow and let go. Um, one of the meditations I got practiced for over 10 years, got through meditation, uh, was align, allow, let go. It was the very first thing that came through, in fact, was align and then allow <laughs> and let go. And, and so uh, that's really the process of been uh, using for resistance, both externally and internally. Even in fact, when the emotions come up, I, I, Jasmine thought what you said was perfect. What I've been l uh, learning is how to integrate with whatever arises, because often our reactions or our cho subconscious choices are to activate some level of meaning, uh, some level of sensation, maybe even action, what have you, but it's all frequency. And if we can learn how to allow, um, we can choose differently in a way that uh, creates harmony with those frequencies, even the frequency of fear, the frequency of uh, panic or what all those things, what I've been learning in myself is exactly that, how to let go of the resistance and um, really align with that knowing, that higher level of consciousness that knows exactly how to do it. And it comes through in ways both energetically and um, intelligently beyond what we would normally recognize. So yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say, yeah, the, the resistance can come in terms of ideas or thoughts. Like, you know, I stayed in a job that I hated for years because I had this idea in my head that don't, don't leave a job until you have a job, which was ingrained in me from when I was young, because it was all about survival. And my first real transition happened when I just quit a job and said, I don't want to be here anymore. And that was that. But then there's also emotional issues where certain feelings that you have are not appropriate in, in certain situations. And then just allowing that to surface can be very scary, you know? Um, and I've been, I mean, I might seem all okay today, but I'll tell you, I've had a rough few months. It's, I've been in a bit of a crisis, a spiritual crisis for the last two months, really. Uh, not a psychosis, not something to get you hospitalized, but it's been very emotional, very, very strong on the emotional dimension and, um, and, and scary at times and very scary in, involving thinking I'm going to lose people that are extremely close to me if these emotions are allowed to surface, you know. So, yeah, it can come in a variety of forms and it can hit you, I think, at any level of your development, you know. This, I would consider this to be like my fourth spiritual surge, you might call it, transformational thing, you know. Four, I mean, the, four times my life has been turned upside down. You might put it like that. <laughs> but it, and it's working for the better. I mean, now I know, it's like when I go into these things after the experience, it's like, Okay, just stick with it, ride it out, go into it, and and you're gonna come out the other side, you know. And you don't know that your first your first rodeo, you might say. You don't know that. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate you sharing so vulnerably. Elizabeth, I know we have some questions waiting from people on the call. We do. Um, the first question, we have quite a few actually, so I'd like to get as many of these in as we can. They're really good. The first one is, um, what are the best ways you've found to hold on to your experience, truth, and your new paradigm in the midst of living in a world that does not believe in STEs? Who'd like to take that first? And again, uh, we're 
make them brief. I'll, I'll go quick. Answer, so, yeah. So I've, I've been more learning to not hold on uh, to what, where I'm at and any perspective that comes through. And that's been more helpful than holding on <laughs> uh, because it keeps shifting and expanding. And um, from what I see, each level we go to, we get this expanded view that builds. So if you try to hold on to something, it creates resistance in of itself. It creates that attachment or resistance and you end up in a cycle of suffering you don't want to be in. Um, so being able to let go, I think, is a, a big part of the journey. Um, so you can continue expanding to whatever next level is for you. I guess I'd say um, that, and I agree with John, you know, to keep going, there's always another place to go. You don't want to stay too attached. But sometimes you're sort of between ideas. You know, you've got your ideas that you used to think about over here. And then you've got these new ideas and new ways of seeing and perceiving that you're sort of tapping into, but you don't quite have a hold on it. And in those moments, we tend to turn to our families and friends for understanding, conversation, and support. And it ain't happening because they're in their model, they're in their box, and that's where they're gonna stay. So particularly where, and for now, they're gonna stay there for now, particularly when people are dealing with issues related to you know, disorders, mental disorders, and things like that, um, people are very closed about these ideas. So I encourage people to find the open door, look to share your experiences, your new insights and things with people who are curious and listening. You know, it doesn't have to be your parents. It can be your odd artistic aunt or something. Um, it could be the guy in, in the, in, at the, the barista at Starbucks. You know, find someone who really resonates with what you're saying, you know. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with, private conversation with everybody on this call, you know, um, just to bounce ideas around and do that. And I, I can't say that for everybody in the condominium I live in. There's no way, you know. I, I have people like living here in my apartment that I'm quite close to. I've seen these people for years and they don't know anything about me because they're not ready for that, you know. They're, they're not ready for that. So we talk MBA, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> that's it. That's great. Talk MBA. I'll talk MBA with you too, as well as all the other experiences. Jasmine, did you have anything to add to that conversation? How do you How manage, do you manage that in a world of, of people who don't believe? I mean, I think John and Sean said it perfectly, um, but I guess I would add another level of that is, you know, not just finding uh, certain people or friends or community, but also that can be done through activism. And that's really, that's really how it was in my life. You know, I started, this experience happened a few months after I was like, where are the people that are, that are fighting for shifts in the mental health system? Where are the people that are, um, you know, interested in being part of, of a new way of thinking about mental health and a new a new way of thinking about spiritual experiences and so that led me on this completely other trajectory find your find your people find people who are kind of working towards the same goal as you and and through that you know once I did that and started doing some grassroots organizing and activism I also wound up um, starting a nonprofit and and starting the Institute for the development of human arts and and now this is another hub same like assist you know these are hubs that people get kind of attracted to and this this is how you this is how you gather and, and you keep working towards a shared goal. Thank you. That is so very true, isn't it? When we're ready to go out from that place of our new birth, the, the, the place, the new tribe, the, the new activism um, organization will show up in your field of awareness. That's right. Uh, we have another question. Um, they would like to know, has your has any of y'all's uh, relationship with organized religion changed? And I know um, Sean, uh, I mean, John and uh, Jasmine have spoken to that briefly. Yeah, I'll just reiterate mine is uh, not only changed in um, making connections to my upbringing and the teachings there, but after a 10 year break away from religion, I end up guided back. So now I speak, hold workshops and uh, teach at all sorts of spiritual centers from Christian to New Thought to um, Unitarian, anywhere I like to say that love is welcome, I'm there <laughs> if I'm invited. So I do a lot of speaking and uh, singing and 
uh, workshops in those communities. And then I see all of them as paths. If you find what works for you, who am I to judge or stop you if you're actually experiencing this love and this intelligence and this connection? If it works, great. You found what works. I'm not the judge of that. You are. So um, to me, it's about just about if you, if you can find it uh, and it works for you, go for it. Beautiful. Sean, do you want to speak to that at all? Well, um, yeah, I was raised Catholic, church on Sundays, this kind of thing. Ended up agnostic through university. Then the experience is starting. You have this whole different orientation. Um, you know, now there's my church right behind me. It's my futon. That's where I meditate. That's, that's my church, you know. Um, and, uh, but I, at the same time, you know, sometimes when people go agnostic or, or, or they start to get spiritual, they can be quite anti-religious uh, because they get angry with the church for doing this and doing that. And um, depending on where a person's at, I might be, like, I might suggest that they try and find a religion that works for them. I think some people at certain, certain points of your life need more structure, need more leadership, you know. And the people who come to me, if they're looking for leadership, they're not really going to find it. They're going to find a coach, but they're not going to find a pastor. You know, I'm not going to tell them what the answers are. They've got to sort of find their own answers. So that's a big difference between, I think, what a lot of people in, in the, the sort of spiritual, spiritual movement or new age spirituality are doing. They're sort of looking to find their own answers. But at some point, some, it's better for some people to have leaders who are, who are telling them how to think at, at certain points. That's my opinion. So you're ready to think for yourself. Thank you, Sean. That's a great perspective. And, and I, appreciate, I appreciate the perspective of um, levels of psycho-spiritual development being brought in to the picture here in this question. And that is true. There are times when we feel like we do need that in order to stay safe. And that safety is, is um, experiencing safety is a very important part of the psycho-spiritual developmental process. So, thank you. Jasmine, did you want to speak any more to that other than what you've spoken? You've spoken? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that it, it, my experience didn't necessarily lead me back to uh, the religion I was raised with, but it certainly allowed me to heal aspects of it that were really painful for me before. And now I'm able to appreciate it in a, in a different way, even if it's not something that I necessarily um, follow. I think there are so many ways that we can get creative with our spirituality. So, yeah. Thank you. And, I, and in my work with experiencers, I have found that to be very true. Um, the perspectives that all of you have mentioned is that there is a healing from their faith of origin, uh, from their family of origin, and a, an appreciation and a respect even that they didn't have before once they've had some expanded healing happen. Um, we have another question uh, for someone going through an awakening and is having one of those am I, cra am I going crazy moments, what would you tell them? It can be really scary if you don't have resources or know someone else that can understand the spiritual emergence experience. I would like to open that. Looks like I'm first again, huh? It's like hitting the buzzer. <laughs> uh, so. It's, that's an interesting question, and uh, I think many of us can relate um, to going through these experiences and, and wondering, am I, quote, crazy, or is something else happening here? And I remember when the knowing used to come out, I'm like, is this like a, a, a alternate personality? What's going on? It's, I didn't understand it. Um, for me, what I found is experience brings trust. And finding those practices that work for us bring the experiences. Um, so, uh, and by practices, I mean breath work, meditation, uh, nature walks, whatever it is that help us relax, um, expand, and, and begin to experience what's arising in a different way. Um, that experience brought the trust. 
And like the first time I'm getting these things and I'm trying them, it's like new territory, am I crazy? What have you, then I apply them, these teachings coming from whatever levels of consciousness. I'm like, okay, how do I, even, how am I accessing this? I apply it and suddenly I, I begin to experience the, um, what it brings and I begin to trust it more and more. And then, uh, so I just feel like for me, that's, it's almost like life always provides us um, with uh, what we need. It's there. If we can learn to relax and trust it and find it, um, it's just finding those things that help us do that, the tools. I feel like that's where, um, like in psychotherapy and in any practice from religion to um, uh, life coaching or whatever we're doing, um, a lot of people don't realize that they can actually find these practices that help them um, begin to tap into that knowing or begin to align with that mystical power that religions call all kinds of things, but then to begin to actually experience it and go beyond just belief. That was my uh, realization was, man, I'm tired of believing because there's so many opinions. And I've tried these things and belief wasn't taking it. But like that teacher Yeshua taught, to know the truth um, uh, comes down to finding things that work for you, teachings that work for you, and uh, that take you beyond just belief and knowing, experiencing. So that's a long-winded answer. I apologize. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that's um, key for me. It's fine uh, in my experience. Beautiful. So we just have um, time for one more question. And this question I'm going to throw out to Sean. It's a question to Sean specifically. Does being on psych psychotropic medications limit one's experience with the holotropic breathwork for bipolar that you do? Could you please explain holotropic breathwork? <laughs> yeah, that take, that'll take a few hours. Um, so it, it's a little bit complicated. The first thing is that uh, holotropic breathwork is a trademarked um, technique from Groff transpersonal training, and it requires a specific format. And usually it's in a group or with a very limited time. Um, and in that format, it's not recommended for people with disorders because it can bring up trauma that those sort of settings are not very good for. That they, they need, You need a safer setting for someone who's probably dealing with deeper trauma. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm doing a private retreat where it's me and one client, one, and a supporter. And then we're using a technique very similar to holotropic breathwork I call bipolar breathwork. And what are we doing? Well, even calling it breathwork is a bit of a joke, to tell you the truth. Because when people have had these non ordinary experiences already uh, in um, so-called psychosis or they've had bipolar experiences, most of the time, we put them in a padded room, like a safe room with a lot of mattresses on the floor, maybe a couple on the wall if we're lucky. And we have another facilitator with me, usually a woman or a female supporter, so there's a male and female energy. And then the first thing we do, like Jasmine was saying, we just stay with them, we just sit with them. And we ask them to just get as comfortable as possible. And we'll just, you know, that's the first step. And usually when that step is in place, the healing starts. That's the crazy thing. People go into non ordinary state spontaneously in that moment, and we just have to sort of ride it out and, and see where it goes. Um, when, when I'm applying more of the technique and bringing more intensity, we're playing intense music, um, usually strong drumming in the beginning. We're asking the person to breathe, like <sighs> something like that. And we're encouraging them to express themselves. And that means through movement, through their body, whatever their body wants to do, and through vocalization. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. You know, so there's this moving, there's this gyration. And that's how people are getting in touch with this healing field and how the healing field unfolds. Um, it was a long process to realize that actually the medications did not get in the way. Because in Groff's work, he was kind of anti-medication, saying the medication was getting in the way. And then we learned, and I learned from other facilitators, that it doesn't get in the way. However, what can get in the way is if you've been 
um, medicated and diagnosed with a disorder for a long period of time, like 20 years, for example. Because if you've had a 20 year disorder, your worldview can be quite guarded. And then all of a sudden I'm asking someone to come in for a one week retreat and everything is about letting go and expressing yourself, you know, and you haven't let go or expressed yourself in 20 years, you know, so, so that's, that's a challenge. And so one of the things I do when I, when I interview people is I'll give them a questionnaire and I want to see if I think that they have the capacity to trust me, to, to surrender to this process, like Jasmine was talking about and to express part of that authentic self, that inner healer, um, healing field John was talking about and allow that to come through and not to control the process with your ego, you know, because your ego is going, well, I can't do this. This isn't right. This isn't, this room isn't right. This idea is stupid. I'm not supposed to, I, I can't, I can't put my arms over my head and just do this without a reason. It's dumb. You know, so there's a lot of blockages that can come in the way, you know, with people. So got to pay, pay attention for that. But the meds are, have not been as big a problem as I anticipated, which, which has been very encouraging. You know, one of the clients I worked with this year, when I worked with him, he was on five medications. You know, Now he's on four. I'm hoping him to get the three. <laughs> but you know, that's a lot of medication. And he had a very strong retreat. So um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the meds. And I guess going back to the previous question, how to handle these, any advice for these shifts, um, people are going through, I would say, don't let the meds get you down. That in the world we live in today, getting medicated is kind of the least worst answer that they have at this point. And you can be medicated and have an experience of spiritual at the same time. You don't have to deny the spirituality because you're medicated. It's not like, well, I have a mental illness and I, and I need medication or I'm having a spiritual experience. So I don't need medication. You can have a spiritual experience completely valid, just like any of us have had. And because you can't stay grounded, you have to take some meds, you know? So for a lot of people, I'd say, you know, medicate and meditate. Don't, don't lose, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. All, right. All right. Can I also piggyback on that for a second? I, I want to Feel say free. that <laughs> <laughs> I, I love what you said, Sean. Thank you. Um, and I also want to mention, you know, going back to that question of, of what do people do in these experiences, you know, I, the first thing I would say is nobody should do it alone. And sometimes people are, are in need of really deep, uh, really strong, catered, supported uh, care. And that's not something that, you know, a, a couple of friends can always provide. We actually need services that are available to everybody because there are so many people that wind up in the mental health system that don't have the money to access, a, you know, a lot of these different methodologies and, and these amazing resources that we have that just never get available to, to people that, that wind up in the mental health system and become institutionalized from day one. And, and there are models that exist, you know, just throwing a few out there. There's a Hearing Voices Network in New York City and there's Soteria, which is a peer-based um, uh, like respite center for people who experience uh you know first episode of psychosis and there's the open dialogue approach and there's so many things that are out there but not enough people know about them and so um i feel like you know we kind of have you know the, the spiritual stuff over here and then we have the mental health stuff over here and i don't believe that they have to be separate we just need to create more access for people to have the services that they need thanks so much for um for closing with that, Jasmine, I think it's important to remember that, you know, that's what we're all here for. We're all here exploring and looking to generate conversation and ultimately resources for experiencers to go to and how to merge these, these resources that are existing within our existing systems and give people alternatives. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, and unfortunately, we do have to wrap. Um, it was such a beautiful conversation, so rich, and everyone has so much to share. And we do have questions we couldn't get to um, just because of time. But of course, there are many more ways to continue the conversation here um, on our website, acist.org, assist.org. You can find out more information about our Peer Experiencer Forum. Um, you can look back on our YouTube channel for other similar conversations and topics that we've explored with um, similar panels to the one here today. 
And of course, we have our annual conference. Um, we're looking at Atlanta, Georgia for fall 2019. What year is this? Yeah, that's next year, right? And uh, we'll have those dates finalized in the next week or so, so look out for that. And uh, we'll be doing another call like this next month in January, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And when we post this to YouTube, we'll have everybody's websites and information there. So if you want to reach out to anyone directly, you can do that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, it's assist.org, A-C-I-S-T-E.org. And if you have any questions for us directly, you can email us at info at assist.org. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists and all of the attendees for logging on and being with us here today. And again, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. There's just so much here that needs to be said. So um, we'll keep this conversation moving in other ways and um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.